Hello and welcome to the second video uh, in my series on metaethics. Um, this one we're going to focus on moral anti-realism and we're going to look at questions of uh, what makes something right and wrong and whether that's a statement of fact or merely an opinion. Uh, as before, this is for AQA philosophy specification 7171 and 7172. And as I always say, um, this should be regarded as a revision video, not a comprehensive overview of the particular subject um, for which your um, teacher will have provided you with um, copious amounts of notes and good work. OK, so the first thing that we're going to look at is anti-realist theory, or rather the only thing we're going to look at in this um, video is anti-realist theories. So according to anti-realist metaethicists, if you can say that, um, there are no such things as moral facts. Uh, and there are three theories behind this. There's error, error theory, which can't say, error theory, um, which says that moral judgments are cognitive statements. Again, you might want to go back and look at cognitive and non-cognitive um, uh, sort of, you know, principles. Uh, in this case, it's a cognitive statement. It's either got to be true or false. Now, the reason it's in here is because error theory basically says that any statements and moral facts are actually all false. Um, the second one is emotivism, which says that moral judgments are non-cognitive statements. They're not true or false. Um, they express approval or disapproval. And the third th theory that we're going to look at is prescriptivism. It basically says that um, moral judgments um, uh, are non-cognitive and instructional. OK, so the first theory that we're going to look at is proposed by a guy called J.L. Mackey, uh, an Australian uh, philosopher. And J.L. Mackey basically says that um, moral philosophy tends to assume that moral objectivity exists. Uh, he also says that this seems to be the case in ordinary language, where people often express the view that something is wrong in itself. Um, so you can kind of get what he means. So if we say that murder is wrong, um, we seem to be suggesting that that's morally objective, that murder is wrong in all instances. And also, um, it seems to be um, that it's wrong in itself, that it seems to be a standalone concept. Um, now, Mackey disputes this, and we'll have a little look at that in more detail. Now, um, Mackey uses uh, the argument from queerness, um, I guess one of those words which has uh, changed its meaning over time. Um, but in this instance, Mackey basically means that it's strange. So Mackey goes on to say um, that if moral properties are cognitive, and therefore either true or false, um, you know, then they must be, you know, something you know, strange or, to use his term, queer, and therefore unlikely to exist. Now, he comes to this conclusion through two principles. He says in the first instance that they might be epistemically queer. If these are basically non-natural properties, i.e. they exist independently of our mind, then they must be something strange because we can't explain them scientifically. We can't observe them. We can't do tests on them, etc. Whereas most things, um, you know, we can do. Um, he also says um, that um, they are metaphysically queer. Um, they must be unlike any other property that we encounter. And again, I think we can probably yes, um, see what he's talking about. Um, you know, we, we understand the concept of something being green, um, but the, something, the concept of something being wrong seems to be much more difficult to kind of pin down. And that's the kind of argument that Mackey is going to, to use. Um, so one of the things that he um, basically uh, concludes is that all moral judgments appear to be false. If moral judgments are cognitivist, um, in other words, they say something true or false about the world, um, but moral properties um, don't exist, then it has to be the case logically that all moral judgments are false. Uh, and this is an example of error theory. 
because we falsely assume that moral properties exist. Um, as I say, you know, some of this content you need to get your head around, but uh, you know, look at the example that I've given here. If you think of the statement murder is wrong, you're assuming that there is a mind independent thing called wrongness and that murder is an example of this. Um, now that would seem to hold that, you know, murder is wrong in all instances, but what about the murder that was a result of, you know, ongoing, persistent and quite horrific domestic violence? Is that still wrong? Well, you know, you can have a debate with someone about that and have a think about that yourselves. Um, in terms of non-cognitivist um, theory, um, then the first one we can look at is emotivism. And basically, emotivism claims that moral judgments are statements of approval or disapproval. Um, nothing more than that. And as such, they are non-cognitivist. Um, they don't claim to be true or false. And again, a scenario here would be, imagine the statement giving money to charity is good. Most people would say, yeah, you know, giving money to charity is a good thing. Um, but what if the charity you're going to give your money to invest those funds in the armaments trade, you know, that they're buying weapons uh, and that's how they're making their money to keep the charity ongoing. Would that be a good thing? Um, would it be a good thing even if the charity helps starving children? Um, so when we, you know, make a statement such as giving money to charity um, is good, uh, we're basically making a statement of approval that we approve um, of that and we think it's a good thing. It doesn't seem to be a moral fact. And again, you know, using the um, argument that or example that I've used, you might want to think about that. Um, now we're going to come on to um, our friend David Hume. Um, David Hume basically says that moral judgments aren't judgments of reason and therefore non cognitivist. Um, in um, his moral theory, he believes that moral actions are driven by motivation, um, which includes how we want to be perceived by others. Um, so if I believe that it's wrong to murder someone, then I will be motivated not to commit the murder, rather than apply um, reason in making that decision. Uh, and again, you can think of instances where you might agree or disagree with that. Um, you know, you can look at murders and think, well, you know, murders are often driven by motives and we talk about, you know, what's the motive for carrying out murder. Um, we very rarely talk about, you know, a reasoned um, conclusion to murdering someone. But uh, as I say, you might want to dispute that. Um he also argues, and this is something that you will have looked on at earlier on uh, within the AS course, whether um, moral judgments are relations of ideas or matter of facts. He argues that they're not, um, that moral judgments happen to be attitudinal. OK, again, you may have come across this earlier in the AS course, um, but it's the is ought problem. One of key, uh, Hume's key arguments is uh, an is ought distinction. And Hume states that you cannot derive an ought from a statement about what is. For example, um, look at your own education. Now, it may be the case that you've got nine GCSEs. In fact, let's say that it is the case that you've got nine GCSEs at level nine. And um, that's brilliant. You know, you've achieved top marks. You are an excellent student. However, it doesn't mean that you ought to get four A stars at A level. Um, you might need to um, have a think about that, but you can see what Hume is driving at. Um, that one is a statement of what is, one is a statement of what ought to be, and it's very difficult to make the leap from one to the other. <clears throat> okay. Um, when we come to the 20th century, um, one of the most um, influential philosophers um, is a guy called A.J. Eyre. Um, now, you may be aware that in the 20th century, a group called the Vienna Circle 
um, started to look at empirical methodology to resolve philosophical problems. It basically said, look, you know, metaphysics and metaphysical questions are too difficult to answer. We're never going to arrive at an answer. So what we need to do is we need to uh, uh, employ um, sort of scientific thinking. And this influenced a British um, philosopher called A.J. Eyre. And A.J. Eyre comes up with a very important concept. It's called the verification principle. Um, basically, the verification principle says um, that if I make a statement, then it's either verifiable as an analytical truth. It couldn't be true any other way. So, for example, triangles have to have three sides. You can't have a four sided triangle. Or alternatively, it has to be empirically verifiable. In other words, that we can carry on doing experiments which prove that it's true um, because it seems to be um, the case when we uh, look at the evidence. So, for example, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade. And then if it doesn't boil at 100 degrees centigrade, we work out the reasons why. So it's a very scientific approach. Um, so Mayer, uh, so Air basically um, goes away and looks at kind of um, moral judgments. And again, we'll use this you know really simple one. Murder may be wrong, but according to Air, can it be scientifically verifiable? And it doesn't seem that it can. However, Air doesn't um, abandon you know moral judgments completely. What it says is that um, that moral judgments are often an emotive expression of our approval uh, or disapproval. So this is an example of emotivism. Okay, another um, theory that we can look at is something called prescriptivism. And again, we're looking at English moral philosophers. In this case, R. M. Hare. And he basically believed that moral judgments were prescri prescriptive claims. Uh, and there are two different types of prescriptive claims. I can't say that word. And one, he says, is imperatives. So something, you know, you you uh, you are someone to shut the door. Um, that's an imperative. The second one is value judgments. Um, and those are praise or criticism, um, such as that's a good piece of work or indeed um that's a bad piece of work. OK, so we've looked at some of the theories regarding um, anti-realism, um, but there are some problems um, that we need to explore and we need to think about. Um, so in the first instance, although they might be appealing, there are, as I say, some problems about them. So non-cognitivist claims seem at odds um, to the way we use language. Um, when we say don't murder, um, we believe that to be an explicit moral judgment. And it seems, um, you know, fairly objective. There doesn't seem to be an instance where we believe that murder is justified or right. Um, the other problems that we have with anti-realism is that it could lead to moral nihilism. Um, if there is a concept that there's no right or wrong, um, then that's going to excuse an awful lot of bad behaviour. And although some may argue um, this is true, um, they would also argue that it doesn't deny moral feelings or judgments. So you can still express something uh, moral, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be true or false. Again, you might want to think about that. You know, if is, for example, stealing always wrong, or are there some um, occasions in which stealing could be justified? Um, we also uh, might argue that non-cognitivism doesn't allow for moral progress. Um, for example, it wasn't so long that we thought that homosexuality was wrong. Now we accept homosexuality, and that seems to show that we have um, made a reasoned sort of conclusion um, that, yeah, um, that, that homosexuality is right, um, and that you know we can move forward because we have um, a foundation of morality, if you like, and we can make sort of progress using that foundation. Okay, so there are a few problems surrounding this, um, and uh, you know, hopefully, when uh, this coronavirus episode is over, if as I say it is over, brilliant. 
um, then we can sort of get back to discussing these issues in class. Anyway, I hope this video helps and, um, you know, there'll be more on the way.